for your word. Uh, Father, uh, we are people that do not live by feeling, and uh, we don't live by emotion, but we are led by your spirit, and we live by the word of God. So we thank you for the opportunity to read the word tonight in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Well, we've seen how Jacob and his family have arrived in the land of Egypt. And Joseph, as a move of strategy, moves them into the land of Goshen. Now, the land of Goshen was a very, very fertile land. It wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't arid desert or anything else. And uh, when, I went to, uh, when I went to Israel, I saw that you, you've got both things where you have very fertile areas, and then you have other places that are like desert areas. Uh, but the amazing thing that whenever God's people moved into an area, an uh, area that was arid became fertile. It's amazing how God works that. Uh, but we're going to find that this is the best chapter in the life of Jacob so far. We've, we've seen Jacob, the supplanter, the deceiver. And um, even though God had called him uh, to be the one that would have the birthright in that family, uh, he felt like moving ahead of God, remember, from the beginning and uh, deceiving uh, Isaac and getting the birthright and deceiving his brother Esau. And uh, so he's been a deceiver, but now he's had enough life happen. Now, you might think that that's pretty simplified, but I want to tell you, most people, as they go through life, they mellow out a little bit, you know what I'm saying? And uh, now... He's not just thinking about God. He's actively uh, uh, serving God, Jacob, or Israel is. So in the first verse in the 47th chapter, Then Joseph came and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brethren, their flocks and herds and all that they have, have uh, come out of the land of Canaan, and behold, they're in the land of Goshen. So, so Joseph is going to present his father and his brothers to the Pharaoh of Egypt. And he took some of his brethren, even five men, and presented them unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto his brethren, What is your occupation? And they said, Pharaoh, thy servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. We saw that shepherds and cattlemen didn't get along in those days. And in fact, remember we talked about the fact that shepherds are not very well thought of at last. If you were going to classify people... Shepherds were right at the very, big, very bottom. They weren't well thought of at all. And uh, so then he goes on to say, They said, Moreover unto Pharaoh, For to sojourn in the land are we come, for thy servants have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is sore in the land of Canaan. Now therefore we pray thee, let thy servants dwell in the land of Goshen. And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. The land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land make thy father and the brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. Now what a statement to make. He, they've already said they're shepherds. And now he said, make, make them ruler over my cattle. So he's saying, I'm not only going to give you a fertile place to stay, but I'm going to have them have a position uh, in this kingdom. And, uh, and I kind of love that because I think it, it speaks of what we get when we accept Christ as our Savior. We're not only made a part of the kingdom, but we have authority in the kingdom. Uh, the Bible is very clear that we're seated at the right hand of God. When it's talking about seated at the right hand of God, that's not meaning that your body is at the right hand of God, but it means that you have a place of, of authority. At the right hand of the Father is a place of authority. And you have a place of authority. Are you glad about that? Uh, he said in the, uh, uh, then he goes on, since sh shepherding was not very popular for the Egyptians, Pharaoh needed someone to care for his cattle. And so now he's really thinking about it. And he said, now I've got people that are very natural and have been all along shepherds. And so uh, and now Joseph presents his own father to Pharaoh. And this is really quite remarkable. I want you to notice that, that Jacob now stands in the best light in which we've seen him during the study of him. Uh, Jacob was always, uh, as I said earlier, uh, always trying to manipulate something. And, uh, uh, and he would put on acts and, 
And he, he was very cunning in, in the things that he did, but he wasn't always acting on behalf of God, was he? And yet we know that God had called Jacob. And, so, and Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and set him before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Notice that Jacob, uh, it's Jacob who's blessing Pharaoh. He's beginning to live up to his name. He is a witness for God now. The lesser is always blessed of the greater, and Jacob blesses Pharaoh as a witness for God. Now, I don't know if you see the significance of this, but that's, that's as if I was to go to a, 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 a leader, and I am the lesser, but even though I'm the lesser, and then I decide rather than wait for my blessing from this man with authority, I'm going to take the place to bless him. Now, that's a pretty bold move, actually. And so, and Pharaoh said unto Jacob, how old art thou? And Jacob said, I'm older than dirt. No, he didn't say that. I thought, uh, at this point, if Jacob were living by that old nature which controlled him in the beginning, he would have said, well, Pharaoh, I'm 130 years old, and I want to tell you that I have accomplished in my lifetime. I'd like to tell you how I outsorted my brother. He would have started bragging on himself. But guess what? Jacob has went through a massive change here. He started becoming the man of God that he was always supposed to be. And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. So is he bragging on himself? No, listen to what he says. He said, uh, I've lived 130 years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been. Man, what is it when a person finally gets to the place where they can accurately look at themselves? That's a place of great growth. You know, you, uh, I'll tell you a story, because I have a lot of them at my age, but I, I may have told you this before. If I have, just endure it. But uh, uh, one time when I was down at a conference, and there was these guys outside the conference that were young men waiting outside to get inside of, of uh, Kenneth Hagin's Winter Bible Conference that I went to every year. And, uh, man, I listened to them, and they were just bragging about what their churches were doing and how much they'd accomplished in their communities and how big a church they were going to have. And God had always told them they were going to have this giant church. I listened to brag and brag and brag. We went to this conference, and I went to a restaurant afterwards, and uh, John Osteen got up, and uh, came over and, and talked to me for just a moment. And that's when he told me, he said, he taught me something about authority. He said, uh, the Lord's revealed to me that he's going to build a ministry and use you to help build that ministry, but he's not going to do it until you submit to your pastor. Well, I wasn't submitted to my pastor. I used to go in to see uh, Pastor Perkin and, uh, at, New, at New Life Assembly of God, and it always sit towards the back, and I would just uh, listen to the service because I enjoyed it. I was ministering on the weekends most of the time, but when I was in town, I'd always go over there and just listen because I just want to be blessed and didn't want to really be a part of it. So then I went up to Pastor Perkin. And I said, I just want to tell you uh, that do you know what I'm doing when I'm not here? No, he said, I have no idea. I said, well, I'm, I'm in the ministry. He said, no, I had no idea. What do you do? I said, I preach and I sing. And... Uh, uh, and then he started using me in there. Did you know after he started using me and I became submitted? Because it really is true that uh, you can't be on a mission until you're under submission. And uh, so I learned that lesson, that we all need to be under submission somewhere. I have people that speak into my lives that I submit to. And I got into a discussion years ago, and they said, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, let me just tell you how much I'm that way. If something happened to my pastor and he went about half nuts and came up, said something to me, and then slapped me upside my face, I would not attack him because he's the man of God that speaks into my life. So even if he makes a mistake, I'm not going not gonna to come against him. I understand what submission to authority is. Then the next thing that happened was walking out the door was T.L. Osborne. And so I followed T.L. Osborne. Out for, before I did that, I told the minister I was with, I said, boy, I'd love to meet him. He said, go up to meet him. I said, I can't meet him. He's T.L. Osborne. He said, no, no, you can meet him. I, I said, we already walked out the door. 
well, go down the hallway and introduce yourself. So I went down there, and uh, when I went down there, I said, Mr. Osborne, Mr. Osborne. And uh, he turned around, he said, yes. And I said, uh, my, my, I'm, I'm Bob Caps. I said, I've used your books on soul winning for many years and have so much respect for you, and I just wanted to meet you. And uh, tears filled his eyes, and he said, you know, this is a wonderful conference, but while you and I are at this conference, millions are dying without Christ. And his eyes were just filled with tears. And I thought, now earlier I'd been at the gate waiting to get in with a bunch of young guys bragging on all the day, and here are two incredibly humble men who've been used mightily by God. And it taught me, and I remember in Jacob here, now Jacob's beginning to realize who he is, and God is humbling, has humbled this man. Can I tell you, you're never more powerful than you are when you finally humble yourself and realize that you are flesh and blood. And if anything happens good in your life, it's going to be because Jesus did it. Amen? Again, this audience with Pharaoh is an opportunity for the old man to boast. But notice how changed Jacob is. He says that he's been 130 years old and he's really nothing to brag about. You know, um, I love that when Philippians, it tells us that Jesus came and he made himself of no reputation. He gave up the, the heavenly uh, place that he had with the Father, and he came here to be born in the flesh as a man. And the Bible said he made himself of no reputation. That's, already, that's always stuck with me, because if Jesus could make himself of no reputation, maybe that's the attitude we should have as well. Amen? And, uh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out uh, from before Pharaoh. My feeling is that Jacob has arrived. What an opportunity he has to boast, but he doesn't take advantage of it. Someone else might have thought Pharaoh's a great ruler, but I, and I want him to know that I was pretty big way up yonder in the land of Canaan. But Jacob doesn't brag. Oh, Father, that we might remember that if anything good happens in our life, it is because of the work that you've done in our life. Jesus, we love you tonight. If, if, help us to remember that you are a mighty God who looked down upon your creation and had love and pity for us and sent your son to die on the cross so that we might have eternal life and have fellowship with you. So, we have nothing to brag about, God. It's all the work that you've done. We thank you for that tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. In our days, we hear so much boasting on the part of Christians. Uh, there are times when it is really good for a person to give testimony about uh, the things that God's done in their life. Uh, but I have been at some ministerial functions over the years where I just grew tired. I grew tired of the braggadocious attitude people had. And, uh, and you'd get a group of Christians together, and they'd want to look back to magnificent things that God had done in their past and talk about that all the time. And you know what? The most wonderful thing that's happened in this pastor's life hasn't been done what he's what hasn't been the things that he's done in ministry and I have some seen some great miracles but the greatest thing that's happened in my life is that Jesus came into it, my life and anything else that happens after that pairs and pales in comparison amen and Joseph placed his father and his brethren and gave them possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in verse 11, in the land of Ramesses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And the land of Ramesses is the land of Goshen. And I don't know why my mom used to get agitated or something, go like this, well, land of Goshen. I don't know what that was, but anyway. And Joseph nourished his father and his brethren and all the father's household with bread according to their families. 
And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. The reason that only Egypt and Canaan are mentioned here because uh, they're the two geographical la locations which are involved in our story about Jacob and Joseph and the family. There's more land than that, but, uh, uh, but God had prepared Joseph in such a way to prepare Egypt to have land for the surrounding areas. And Joseph gav gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for their corn which they bought, and Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. Now we're coming into something for which Joseph has been criti criticized. People say he took advantage of poverty and he brought up the, uh, uh, bought up the land. Uh, in other words, he closed in on the mortgages and bought the land. I felt this is an unreal criticism of Joseph because what he actually did was do exactly what God said to the saving of his, his own people. And uh, did you know that it's smart? Did you know that when the economy, when stocks go down, while the poor are selling, do you know who's buying? The rich are. Because the smartest thing you can do is buy when the price goes down and not sell till the price goes up. But and when money had failed in the land of Egypt and into the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money faileth. And Joseph said, Give your, give your cattle, and I, will give you, uh, and, and I will give you for your cattle, if money fail. And they brought their cattle unto Joseph, and Joseph uh, gave them bread in exchange for horses and for their flocks, for the cattle and the herds, for the asses. And he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. And when that year was ended, they came unto him a second year and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord, how that our money is spent. My Lord also hath our herds of cattle. There is not aught left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh. And give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians sold every man his field, because the famine prevailed over them, so the land became Pharaoh's. Man, the, f the famine was horrible. But can I tell you this? Joseph was just being wise. That's being wise. You know, not too long ago, I had a man that was kind of in trouble, and he had a motorcycle, and he said, the only thing I got is a motorcycle to sell. He said, I know it's worth more than that, but uh, would you buy it? I said, yes, I will. Did I help him out? Did I come out better in it? Yeah. How many people know that that's wisdom? It's not being mean. It's wisdom. And I've always looked at things like that. If, we, uh, if you know somebody that's getting ready to lose their home, but you can buy them out of their home so that they're so that their credit won't go bad, and they're asking you to do that, but you know you're buying it uh, at a good price, isn't that wisdom? Yeah. You guys hearing what I'm saying? For too many times, people thought, well, Christians should never do that. No, Christians ought to be the ones doing that. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. I had a guy ask me one time, he said, uh, Man, I must be getting old. I thought that was a dog going by, and it's Brindley walking on her <laughs> all fours. Anyway, so uh, uh, I had a guy ask me, another pastor one time, he said, uh, do you try to find out where people make money? I said, no. And he said, even if they're tithing to the church? I said, I don't care where they make it. What if somebody's a crook and they make money uh, and give it to the church? I said, my job's not to figure out where money comes from. My job is to put it to work for the Lord. The wealth of the wicked, say that, is laid up for the righteous. Amen. And so we ought, to, I've often believed that the richest people on the planet should be Christians. Because my, I remember my mother, when I'd go to her when I first got into ministry, and things were very, very tight. And I said, Mom, boy, you know, things are kind of tight. She goes, well, your father has the cattle on a thousand hills. I say he needs to sell some of them for some cash and send it down to Heart of God Fellowship. Uh, 
But I want to tell you something. Uh, and as for the people, he removed them to cities from one end of the borders of Egypt to the other end thereof. There was a great migration in the urban uh, areas so they could be near the center of supply where the grain was stored. You remember that Joseph had chosen these centers throughout Egypt at the very beginning. He now brings the people where they'll be close to the supply of food. Did he buy their land? Yes. Then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. Lo, there is seed for you, and ye shall sow, ye shall sow the land. And it shall come to pass in the increase that thou shalt give a fifth part unto Pharaoh, and four parts shall be your own. Does that sound like such a bad deal? No. And four parts shall be your own for seed of the field, and for your food, and for them, and for your households, and for food for your little ones. What did he do? He made wise investments, and he turned around and blessed the people that he moved to the cities and so that they could, still, uh, they could still make profit and take care of their families and then give a fifth of it to uh, Pharaoh. I think that's pretty wise, isn't it? Uh, I remember uh, years ago, in a, the guy who led me to the Lord had a rescue mission. And uh, one time he said, I worked construction then for a mechanical contracting company, and he had an old uh, uh, international pickup out there, a tool pickup, and, and Pastor Joe said, can you see whether or not he would donate to this ministry? I said, so I went to Orville Luckinville. I said, is there any chance that you'd donate that old truck? It's been sitting there a long time. You're not using it. He said, to what? I said, to, the, uh, to Joe's inner city mission. And he said, yeah, he can have it. So he got it running. And then Joe trained people how to paint houses. So they learned how to have a skill that they never had before. Now, did Joe make money on that? Yes. When they left that mission, did they have a skill they could have a living? Yes. Do you see how this ought to work when we're helping people? Not just hand them stuff, but teach them how to, how to accomplish things with their life. And this is what Joseph is doing right here. And they said, Thou hast saved our lives. And let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt unto this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth part, except for the uh, land of the priests only, which became uh, not Pharaoh's. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Go Goshen, and they had possessions therein, and grew, and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the whole age of Jacob was 140 and 7 years. Do you know why he lived that long? Because he had one of them Jack LaLanne videos and kept in good shape. <laughs> oh, no, that's not true. No. And, <laughs> and the time drew nigh that Israel must die, and he called his son Joseph and said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. Do you remember we talked a long time ago that that was one of the ways you, you cut covenant with somebody, made a promise to them, put your hand under their thigh. And deal kindly and truly with me, bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. But I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt and bury me uh, in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. And he said, swear unto me. And he swear unto him, and Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. Uh, man, it's a touching thing. He's letting them know, I'm so grateful that I'm here, but I want to be buried where my fathers are buried. I think there are several factors which entered into Jacob's request to bury, be buried back in the land of Canaan. He's 147 years old. He became alarmed that he'll die in the land of Egypt. It's clear to him now. The success of Joseph in acquiring all the land for Pharaoh made him believe that he, his family might become, a, become comfortable in Egypt. He never wanted to return to Canaan. His age certainly told him that he would die shortly. I would think in this day and age, somebody lived 147, they'd be pretty sure death's right around the corner, wouldn't they? And... Uh, uh, the hope of the Old Testament is an earthly hope. And the fact that Jacob wants to be buried back in the land is evidence of his faith in the resurrection. 
He hopes to be raised from the dead in the promised land. And Jacob's now becoming a man of faith. You know, I, if, if I lived 147, I don't, have, I, wait, I don't want to wait until I'm 100 or 130 to develop faith. Amen. <laughs> Let's live a life of faith. Now, we're going to go ahead and get started in the 48th chapter. And Joseph visits Jacob during his last illness. And it came to pass after these things that, that, that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father's sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and, and one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. Imagine the thrill that fills the heart of this old man. Here comes Joseph. Joseph was his favorite. I told you we're not supposed to have favorites. But it does happen, doesn't it? And he said unto me, now we see the faith of Jacob. And he said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply, and I will make thee a, a multitude of people, and will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. Pay attention to God's promise that Jacob mentioned, which runs through the Old and New Testament. He made the promise of the line of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Three specific things. One, he'd make them a nation. Two, he'd, he'd make them a land. Number three, he said they'd make them a blessing. You know, uh, uh, understand this. Uh, one, of, one of our senators said not too long ago, don't, don't come against Israel or God will come against you. Uh, this promise goes way back to the beginning that uh, the ones that bless Israel will be blessed of God and those that curse Israel will be cursed by God. Now, uh, I've tried to tell you this before, but I want you to understand there are some things that God has put into the spiritual world that are just, just the way that they're laws of spirituality, and they don't have anything to do with God saying, I'm going to do this. Uh, if you make a mistake, I'm going to do that. He doesn't have to. Uh, gravity, and let me put it like this, gravity is a, uh, is a natural law. Did you know when somebody falls off a roof, God doesn't have to say fall off a roof. He set forth the, the physical law of gravity. So if you fall off a roof, what's going to happen? You're going to hit the ground. I'm, I'm reminded of that because we had a friend fell off a roof and, and, uh, and the wife said, maybe this is just God's time for him. I said, God wants your husband's spirit. He doesn't have to push him off a roof to get it. He would be sitting in his chair. I want to be sitting in my chair, reading my Bible, or just meditating on the Lord when my spirit leaves this body. But I think we're going to be raptured together, folks. That would be a good thing, wouldn't it? Uh, and so a promise had been made, and that promise was on down the line. And, uh, and now thy two sons, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt, but before I came into thee unto Egypt are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they, they shall be mine. And thy issue which thou be, uh, begettest after them shall be thine, and thou shalt be called after the name of their brethren and their inheritance. These two grandsons, the sons of Joseph, will each become a tribe. One would conclude that there are 13 tribes of Israel uh, since there are 12 sons, and now the, the sons of Joseph, and each has become a tribe, there was no tribe of Joseph, but there were the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. Yet the Bible counts 12 tribes. See, the tribe of Levi was not counted as a tribe. They were the priests, and so they weren't counted as a tribe. At, and down here in the seventh verse, and as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way, when yet there was but a little way to come into Ephrath, and I buried her there in the way of Ephrath, and the same at Bethlehem. Uh, you and I sing, O little town of Bethlehem, we think of the birth of Jesus. But if Jacob could sing it, he'd be thinking primarily the death of his beloved and bountiful Rachel. And Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? And Joseph said unto his father, They are my sons, which God has given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. I wish that people get a hold of an idea that uh, when God initiates a blessing, 
uh, it is, they are blessed. Uh, that's it. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so they could not see. And he, and he brought them near unto him, and he kissed them, and embraced them. And, uh, uh, and Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God hath showed me also thy feet. What's he saying? I thought I was never going to get to see you again, Joseph. But I get to see you, and I get to see, uh, get to see your seed as well. And Joseph brought them out from ben, b between his knees, and he bow bowed himself to his face to the earth. And the two boys tried to get away from their grandfather when he lavished his affection on them. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. Joseph is bringing the boys to their grandfather that he might bless them. The one who would stand before Israel at his right hand would be the one with priority. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And Ephraim is to become the leader above Manasseh. Uh, if you ever try to get me to try to convince you why God does things like that, I can't tell you. But he's an amazing God, isn't he? Why so many times did we find the younger blessed instead of what was the natural thing for the older to be blessed? He was the younger. And we saw that, you see that time and again, you wonder what, what is the thing. I think, uh, 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 and I want to say this and not have any bit in my sin misunderstand. I think great error comes when we try to think of why God does things at times because we come up with conclusions that may be far from what's the truth. Can it be all right just that God did it and since he did it it must be right? Amen. Even through Jacob couldn't see too well. He could tell what Joseph was doing. Joseph was pushing the older son to the position of Jacob's right hand, the younger son toward the left hand. So what did old Jacob do? Well he just switched hands. <laughs> he crossed his hands and put his right hand on the younger son. Why did he do this? No doubt he had a tender affection for both boys. They were the sons of his favorite son, Joseph. He knowingly gives the blessings to the younger. And I think one reason he may have done that is because the younger, he had re as, as the younger, he had received the blessings. So he passed his blessing on the younger here. Who knows? And he blessed Joseph and said, God, whom before my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long until this day. I love that. The God which fed me all my life long until this day. Do you ever forget about the blessings God's given you? Man. Did you know if you started each day by remembering God's blessing and spending a little time thanking him, you'd have a much better day. The angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be named on them in the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. The angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. He has nothing to boast about except for a wonderful redeemer. And they did grow into a multitude. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he shall also be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater, greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. His seed shall become a multitude of nations. Joseph had better accept this because he's, a, he's not the oldest either. He happens to be one of the youngest, and yet the blessing is given to his son. And he blessed him that day, saying, In thee shall all Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim, Ephraim and as Manasseh, and he and Ephraim before Manasseh. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again into the land of the fathers. Amen. Moreover, I have given to the to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite uh, with my sword and with my bow. Joseph, through his sons, 
would have a greater inheritance than the other bro brothers would have. Man, uh, this apparently is a personal gift he's making. But what I see in these chapters, and we'll get into 49 next week, what I see in these chapters is, is the growth of Jacob. I see that, uh, uh, as I said earlier, when you try to understand how God does everything, you, you, you just have to accept it. I had uh, a guy actually ask me this one time when I was teaching on creation. How do you know God did it that way? How the Bible says so. Yeah, but how do you know? I know because the Bible says so. How do you know that Moses parted the water? Because the Bible says so. Say that, the Bible says so. Until that's reason enough, let me tell you what's going to happen this. I know this. Uh, in these latter days, there's going to be a lot of voices out there. Not all the voices are the voices of God. Not all, not all those that say, I am of Christ, are really of Christ. Not all those that, that say they speak for God really speak for God. And so, if you are led by emotion, you are the one that will be deceived by the false teachings in the future. But if you're led and grounded in the Word, you'll be solid as a rock. Amen? Father, we just thank you and we praise you. We thank you for all that you do in our lives. We thank you for the Word of God, which is a wonderful thing. We love the stories that we've, that we've studied so far. We give you praise and honor and glory for it because we know the Word is a powerful, living thing. We give you praise and honor for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to be done with Genesis here pretty soon, ain't we? You made it. And I guess we'll have to start in Exodus. Do you know why we're going to go to Exodus? Well, it's the next book, so why not, you know? I cannot believe my wife made me eat this caramel bar. See?